meeting is being First of all, I would like to acknowledge that I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I know that other people uh, are coming from different areas. Um, I see that Paul Morant is still having a little difficulty. Richard, I don't know if you can help Paul, but um, I'm going to carry on with the meeting. I will tr try and help Paul, but I'm not sure what his problem might be. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to have a talk primarily by Don and Lorna Blake, and a bit by me also. It turns about uh, a trip down the Rhone River. It turns out that independently, uh, the two of us booked the same trip, two weeks apart, except uh, Don went upriver and we went downriver. And we found out close to the time that we were both doing the trip. And uh, I asked if Don would mind uh, telling us to, to this group his experience. And uh, uh, I'm going to chip in a little bit with a couple of parts that I did that uh, were optional that he didn't do. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Don to get started. He's going to run all the slides and uh, I'll talk at the appropriate time. And I'm going to view to the speaker. And I'm going to ask everybody to mute themselves, please. Again, everybody, please mute yourselves. Thanks, Paul. Uh, anyway, as, as Paul indicated, we were in basically the, the same time of year on the same river, just going in opposite directions. Uh, Lorna and I flew from from uh, Vancouver to Amsterdam and then on to Marseille. And we were picked up in Marseille and driven to Avignon where our, our tour started. We did the, the tour with Viking. And you can see on the map here, we the the places where we stayed overnight are marked with a, a circle with a, a filled in white. And there are other stops on along the way that are also indicated, particularly Vivier and Arles. Uh, and after our eight-day cruise, we took the, there was an option for optional extension to Paris, so we had three days in Paris uh, afterwards as well. The uh, just something about the about the river. It's uh, derived from a, a Celtic name for something that rolls. the The total length of the river is about eight hundred thirteen kilometers, beginning in the Swiss Alps, Swiss Alps, and uh, at Arlet it splits in two, and it created in the Camargue region, which which Paul is going to talk about, uh, there's vineyards on along uh, long stretches of, of the river, which date from from Roman times, and uh, the the relocation of the papacy and and uh, to Avignon in the 14th century gave a big boost to wine production because they that was a, a big deal for the uh, for the Catholic hierarchy, I guess. Uh, the uh, the river used to run just wild, but in the early 20th century, there were they added uh, a, a system of locks. There are 12 locks between the Mediterranean and Lyon, which was the end of our river tour. Tour, and uh, Lyon itself is about 187 meters above sea level, so not not a huge climb, but uh, nevertheless definitely aided, assisted by the locks. This is a picture of our ship, the Hermode. I'm not sure that's the correct pronunciation. Anybody who knows Norwegian can correct me. And it's uh, as most of the ships in the Viking line are named after figures in in uh, Norse fables. Uh, this most th this particular ship, and I think they're all quite similar, holds 190 passengers with a crew of 53. Uh, quite uh, you know, very good shape. It was built only in 19 in 2014. Now, we went with Viking, but uh, uh, there are several other cruise lines that do this, the same thing and which virtually this, the same stops. In our case, the, the tour was eight days long, and there were uh, several, seven included walking tours. That is, that you didn't have to pay extra for them. So every place we had this, with a walking tour, there would be a, a local guide who would uh, uh, take us through the, the highlights of the area that we were in. And in, in addition, I think at virtually every place we stopped overnight, there was the option, there were optional tours. And we're going to be talking about them a little bit later on. 
just to give you an idea of the cost, I, I, I looked at the latest figures for 2024. The, the fare between mid May to late May to mid June, which is when we went, uh, but the, a year ago, 2023, was about $5,400 per person. Uh, plus air, which we're talking about $1,200 per person, you could, the, the $5,400 would get you a a suite in the, at the water line, where you could watch the ducks floating by. But if you ever take one of these tours, I really recommend you get a veranda suite or, a, or a, what they call a French balcony, which is basically a sliding glass door, which is the full height of the, of the, uh, of the cabin, uh, just to get some fresh air. When we did the a tour previously on the Danube with Viking, we both came back with terrible colds because we we had uh, cheaped out and got uh, one of the waterline suites, and I think that's where all the bugs gathered. Gathered. The uh, I mentioned that we were picked up at the Marseille airport and delivered to Avignon to the to the ship. But the first thing the ship did was uh, turn around, and go downstream to Arla which uh, I guess they did that because there was more docking space in, in Avignon. We're, we're going to visit that the next day in any event. And Arla really known for, I guess, really impressive Roman ruins. We'd been there a couple of years ago when we were driving, uh, went by car. Uh, so we had a, 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 we knew what we were going to get into and it was just a pleasure to revisit them. And of course it was the, the home of Vincent van Gogh during his most productive period. And also, it has a, a magnificent old 800-year-old uh, cathedral, Saint uh, Trophim. And on the slides, you just get an idea of the uh, some of the remains of the old walls. And the the one on the bottom is the the uh, a pair of lions who guarded the remains of a bridge that used to cross the Rhone at at Arle. But to me, one of the real highlights was the the Roman arena constructed in, in 90 AD. Now what you're seeing here are, are three stories, are three levels of arcades. And when this arena was originally built, uh, the entire circumference was three story, was three levels high. So the, but uh, during the Middle Ages, most of these Roman areas became village uh, quarries where the stones were basically ripped out to, to build uh, uh, houses and other structures for the, for the, for the population, uh, just some, some other shots of the uh, uh, of the arena. The uh, it's amazingly well preserved, except for the missing third story in most in most cases, uh, be because during the mid uh, Middle Ages it actually became a, a fortification of sorts. In the top uh, left slide at the back, you'll see a, a square tower that actually was uh, built in the medieval times when they. They filled in all the arcades, all the arches, built these towers as watchtowers. I think there were four of them around the circumference of this arena uh, and basically had homes inside. At, at one point, they said there were 200 homes inside the inside the walls. Now, since then, I guess people feel less threatened, so they took the stones out of the arcade, and now they've restored the, the arena itself. Which is still in use today. It's used mainly for bullfights, both the uh, the uh, French style bullfights where the where the bull survives, and you'll see some of the bulls in Paul's pictures. The the bulls from Camargue have horns that are horizontal, and the the successful matador basically gets a rosette off the horn of one of these uh, bulls while they're challenging it. But they also like two, two or three times a year have a Spanish bullfight, and the Spanish bulls have horns that project forward and that's where they they basically do a dance to the death of either the matador or the bull and it's 99.9 percent .9 of the time the bull that gets killed uh, on the left here is a a, a replica of the uh, original arena which is uh, housed in a, a wonderful museum in Arla. we didn't go to it on this trip but we've been there before where they have a lot of, of the uh, sculptures from the from the Roman times on display, and they had created this model of the uh, of the arena, and you I hope you can see it, but it had, it had a retractable roof, and I think it probably didn't cost them as much as it cost to put a retractable roof on 
BC place, even allowing for the cheaper Roman currency at the time. Uh, but I guess they had a lot of slaves who could put all the put the effort into it. Anyway, it was a, a wonderful model. The other main Roman attraction in Arla is, is the remains of the Roman theater, which again has been heavily quarried by middle people in the Middle Ages. But at one point it would hold about 10,000 people. The arena, they estimated it would hold 10, uh, 20,000, but the, the theater would hold about 10. And they still use it now. You can see at the back of the slide, there are uh, there's still a seating area and they actually put on plays and so on in, in the summertime. And they can hold about 2000 people in this in this space. Uh, our, our guide took us on the uh, a tour of, of Arla as all the guys did in all the other places we went. And this is a magnificent uh, uh, Romanesque uh, Saint, Tro uh, Saint Trophime uh, Cathedral. It's actually on the pilgrimage route to Santiago de Compostela as well, so it's it's, it's well visited. And the, what's the re real attraction for for us was all the sculptures on the en uh, entryway into the into the church. I've only um, used a handful of, of them for this presentation, but the uh, red, red dead center is one I've, hi I've, I've, I've highlighted on the right which is Christ and uh, the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, just beautiful uh, sculptures. But the the real story on the front of this is the uh, the uh, the day of judgment. And there are sculptures that are weighing up of souls. They, they show people frying in hell. The character on the right-hand slide doesn't look too happy uh, where he or she is. Uh, and uh, probably was not a, probably wound up in, in hell. Now the other main thing that people go to Arla for, of course, is to to walk in the footsteps if they could of uh, Vincent van Gogh. And this is a one of his most famous painting is painting. Well, this the subject of his several of his paintings is a Café La Nuit. Uh, the one of the most famous ones was painted as if it were the café was at night. And at night, the the awnings would have been uh, well. The place mm -hmm. would have been illuminated, and there'd be light shining in behind the awnings, which gave it the yellow uh, yellow color. Now, the, the people who bought this bought the building now thought we can fix, we can uh, have the best of both worlds. So they painted the awning, put up yellow awnings, and it's mm -hmm. now considered all the guidebooks call it a tourist trap. We didn't actually go in there; we just took a Actually, the paella that this woman is making on the on the edge of the patio looked pretty attractive, but we uh, we didn't go in there. Now, our, our uh, back up a bit on the uh, on the uh, the walking tours. The Viking be, wants to make sure that everybody has a, a a relatively small group, no more than a dozen or so people in any in a, any tour, and, and everybody's rigged out with one of these uh, listening devices, so you can hear the the. Uh, the guide, even if he or she is not visible at, at, at a given time, uh, but the so the uh, and the and the the groups can be graded in terms of your how vigorous a walker you are. So we were we did we chose the limp and lame group. So it was uh, our pace was a bit slower, and we didn't get into all the all the places that some other the people other people did. But we still had a fantastic time, and we didn't have to climb many, many, many stairs or to get up to the top of the ramparts. Now this is, uh, as I say, Van Gogh was one of the the feature <laughs> or the, the history of of his stay in, in Arla is one of the, the main attractions of the of the place. He was there for about 15 months beginning in 1888 and was considered his most productive period. Uh, and he created nearly 300 paintings while he was, was in Arla and in the he was in a, a, a sanatorium in Saint Remy after he basically cracked up. Um, and at one point, he invited the painter Paul Gauguin to join him. Our guide was very knowledgeable about the two artists, and she had a book that she carried along with us. Uh, and we stopped at various places where Van Gogh would have been uh, used, uh, where he was painting from. And she, so you could actually see what, what it was that Van Gogh was looking at when he created what it what it was on the on the, on paper 
And it, she also had paint areas where the, she could compare what Gauguin and, and, and Van Gogh saw in the same scene. So here's, here's one from the uh, Café La Nuit. The one on the left is by Gauguin, and the one on the right is in Van Gogh. Apparently Van Gogh didn't like to paint faces. So most of the faces are, are just kind of blobs, whereas Gauguin's faces are much more detailed. And there are other differences in the, in the techniques as well. I'm not enough of a art connoisseur to be able to, to uh, uh, talk about them all with uh, I remember that they said Gauguin was very sparing in his use of uh, the oils. He, very smooth, uh, in, in the old style. <clears throat> and Van Gogh was, uh, he liked texture. And so his painting was really laid on thick. And apparently if you go to a museum uh, and you're looking at the pictures through a cam your own camera, taking pictures, you will miss all that depth of the the sparkles and and shadows that are created by these gobs of paint so um yes so this guy on the right has more texture and our, our walking uh, tour also included the this is the set the hospital that van gogh went to after he cut off his ear and it's now a library and an art gallery and there's a nice little coffee shop in the corner as well where we which we uh had a, a snack and a drink at uh, this is the vantage point for one of Van Gogh's most famous paintings, Starry Night on the Rhone. And the next, the next slide will show you what it looks like. Well, I got this picture, obviously, off, off the internet. And now it's worth an estimated over $100 million U.S. at the New York Museum of Modern Art. Apparently, according to our guide, and I haven't found anything that contradicted it, Van Gogh sold only one painting during his lifetime. And now, of course, they're worth his total oeuvre is probably worth a gazillion. So the next, uh, so after our trip to Arles, we motored back on and spent the night in Avignon. And then the next day had our, our tour of Avignon itself. And the old old city is completely encircled by the original wall. It's a, it's a fantastic sight. And apparently this, these wall used, walls used to be four meter, about four meters higher than they look now. And that's because they, the walls haven't changed, but there've been so much flooding over the centuries of the, of the Rhone and the, the silt is deposited, making the walls look like the walls have shrunk. Um, anyway, there are just a few shots of the of the city itself. It's a magnificent, magnif magnificent looking uh, uh, city hall. And in France, you basically have to. You can have a church wedding, but if it wants to, if you want it to be legal, it has to be. You have to have a civil wedding as well. So this is a couple who've just come out after their civil ceremony and having a chat with a couple of friends. Uh, on the left is our, our group. You can see why some of us were limping and lame. There's a couple of walkers. <laughs> and on a our, wheelchair. And a wheelchair on our group as well. Uh, this is called the uh, Place de l'Horloge. It's named after the clock tower that you can't see anymore because they built the city hall in front of it. But anyway, <laughs> in medieval times, it was the main the main square of, of Avignon. And then just uh, uphill from that, along the, the uh, Rue de la République, is the the Palais de Pape, the Pope's Palace, and uh, Notre Dame, a, a church. Both are uh, really interesting looking. It's, uh, there's so much space around them; it's it's great. You can you can really get a sense of how massive these huge, these places were. the The guy suggested the reason the Palais de Pape has has survived since it was built in the 14th century is that the uh, it, it was used as an army barracks. So that, during the revolution, they needed a place to, to quarter the troops. And I guess during the various wars that Napoleon was involved in. So they actually they were able to preserve the, uh, the building. So I'm not sure how many people know about the, the, uh, the situation there, but basically the, the, when the French Pope was, was elected, Pope Clement, he decided Italy was particularly, Rome was too dangerous. So he moved the papacy to uh, to Avignon, where it, it remained for about 70 years. The last uh, couple dozen years, there were two popes because the Italians said, well, we want, we want the papacy back. So they basically elected their own pope, and it wasn't until the 1400s that the, uh, the schism was, was resolved. 
And here's some of the shots of the uh, magnificent architecture. Uh, the outside is kind of ugly, but the inside is full of uh, really striking features. The Chapelle Saint-Jean, the Chapelle Saint-Martial. Uh, and the the other thing, I, I, I threw this in here because it's something I, we hadn't known before we got to Avignon, is that it's probably the center in France for live theater. And uh, once a year, they have uh, all kinds of venues devoted to uh, uh, premieres of uh, and reruns of various uh, live theater productions. Uh, our our, our walk-in tour ended at a, at a flea market and a and a one of the nicest covered markets we've ever ever been to. It was the one of these markets where um, every the, the the displays were fascinating. Of course, very colorful. We were particularly struck by the, by the arrangement of fish, which was really quite artistic. You'd almost hate to buy anything there because you disrupt the the display. The schools of fish. That's right. And the the other thing was that the, there was no uh, there were no bad odors at all in this building, and the even though there were a couple of fish uh, fish places, and of course other other places would could develop their own odors. But apparently at one o'clock, it's only open to one o'clock every day, and they basically clean it from top to bottom the rest of the, uh, after the, after it closes. Now Paul is going to take over and I'll ask him to tell me when I should click the switch. Yeah. So I did one of the optional tours out of uh, Arles actually, to the Camargue region, uh, which you'll see where Arles is at the top. And first we went down to where you see the pink flamingo, which is a, like a bird sanctuary at this time, yeah. yeah. Then we went from there to <clears throat> St. Marie de la Mer, which is down at the bottom and to the left. And then we went even further to the left to Aigues-Mort uh, in this tour. So we'll start with the uh, bird sanctuary. Next. Next slide. And it was a, not a very pleasant day. It was uh, raining all the time, sprinkling, 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 gray. But the guy said, you know, we're lucky in a way in that there are more birds here today than usual, especially the pink flamingos for which this particular bird sanctuary is famous. And here we'll see lots of pink flamingos. Just keep going slowly and go on, uh, Don. Oh, wow. Next. And there are many times that we had a whole flock of them just flying overhead and coming to land or taking off. And all of these were just taken with my iPhone because I didn't uh, want to have my other camera totally wet. It was a pretty nasty day. So off we went now to St. Marie de la Mer. Next. And this is named after the three Marys, Marie Madeleine, Mary Magdalene, Marie Salome, and Marie de Cleophas, Mary of Clopas. And these three Marys were closely linked to Jesus. And it says here the designation de la mer of the sea derives from a medieval tradition that after Jesus' resurrection, the three Marys escaped the Christian persecution in Judea and traveled across the sea <clears throat> with boat, living in the Camargue the rest of their lives and helping to bring Christianity to France. So this is their legend or story, whether it happened or not, we don't know. Next. So this is the church of St. Marie de la Mer. And on the day that we were there, it was a Sunday and there was a service going on. As you can see here, we were allowed to go in. Next slide. And one of the things that uh, happens here is um, there's a place where the gypsies come. And they um, will come for a festival every year, just when we were there in May. And you'll see this um, painting by Van Gogh in 1888, it's, uh, when he was in Arles. And it's a gypsy camp that was near Arles. Next slide. So there's a rope. Sorry, go back one. Oops. 
Yeah, so there's a Roma festival, a gypsy festival, last two weeks of May, and 10,000 Romani people come to St. Mary. Now, they worship a saint called St. Sarah, also Sarah La Cali or Sarah the Blacks, a black saint, and that's their patron saint. And the center of veneration for this saint is St. Marie de la Mer. Now, mm -hmm. we didn't see any of the gypsies. It was during the day we were there in the, uh, around lunchtime in the early afternoon. And apparently the reason for that is that they're up the whole night dancing, drinking, eating, celebrating. And then they sleep during the, the day and get up in time to, for dinner and to celebrate again during the next evening. So while we were there, they were all sleeping. So we didn't see them around the, the town. Next slide. Now there are two symbols here. Uh, that were on the wall outside the bull ring and uh, bullfighting ring. One is the Camar cross, which is the emblem of St. Marie de la Mer. And that cross represents faith, the anchor, hope, and the heart, love. Mm -hmm. And then you see the symbol of the bull. And this is a big thing in this area, bullfighting, and rearing bulls for bullfights. Next picture. And we were taken for lunch to a farm where they raised these fighting bulls. And these are two of the bulls on this farm that were prized bulls. And the, the, the people who raised the bulls carried them out to uh, people who want to have bull fights in the ring. And <laughs> they pay according to whether they, how many fights they've won during their career. So they're quite valuable bulls. Next uh, picture. So the last stop on this trip was to go toward Egg Mort. And Egg Mort means dead water. Uh, in Ossitan, which is the dialect in the area, is Aigas Mortis. Next uh, picture. And Egg Mort is a very interesting uh, uh, town, much smaller than Avignon. But like Avignon, it has a complete wall around the whole city. And you could actually walk on the ramparts of this wall. And we went inside that uh, area that has that tower. And what you're seeing on the right hand side is a photograph taken from the bottom of the tower looking right up to the top. Through the little hole where the cross is at the top. Next picture. And from on top of the, the tower, there's a lookout and you can look around uh, 360 degrees around that uh, tower. And here we're looking at a canal that will communicate with the Rhone River and the river boats on this canal. Next picture. One of the things that this area is famous for is production of salt. And so there are piles of salt that you can see here in salt marshes that they collect the salt from outside the town itself. Next picture. Some, I'm now on the inside of the walls, and that's on the right picture. We're looking at the wall from the inside. You can see the steps that you would go up to walk around the ramparts of this wall. And there are emblems that you can see, like the one on the left, again, to do with bullfighting, which is important. Next picture. And just walking down the little street there, there was an interesting old church, um, which uh, <coughs> leads to the Crusades back in the 1200s. Next picture. I just love the displays here in this uh, place where you can buy piles of different kinds of cookies and sweets. Pick next picture. And there was jasmine in bloom everywhere. And some big displays of jasmine in front of some people's houses and shops, as you can see in two of them here. Next picture. So then we went back to Avignon, uh, which was the end of our tour, not the beginning, because we were coming from Lyon down south. And where we were docked was very close to this area, that the picture that I've just shown you here. And the first thing in the morning before breakfast, I like to go out for a walk. And along the river, it's very pleasant to walk. And there was a lot of fog first thing in the morning off the river. And that's why we were looking here at Notre Dame 
and the Palais de Pape on the right-hand side in the early morning fog with very little traffic at that time. Next picture. And similarly, as we walked along the water, we come to the famous Pont d'Avignon. You know the children's song, Sous le Pont d'Avignon, it relates to this particular bridge, uh, and again in the fog. And by the time I came back, came back from the walk, the fog was lifting. Next picture. And so now we can see the same things without the fog. Next picture. The sun was starting to come up. Next picture. And we also did a tour of the Palais des Papes. And on the right hand side, this is the, meet the meeting room where uh, the leaders of the papacy would come together to have a meeting. And right off of this meeting room, there was a kitchen so they could get their food cooked. And uh, on the left-hand side picture, you see the chimney from this particular kitchen, which is a rather large chimney serving this whole kitchen area off this dining area. Next picture. And I, this is the left-hand picture is taken within this uh, um, same room. I just like the light, how it was coming in from the window. And on the floor, there were all interesting kinds of tiles. Next picture. And on the wall, there were frescoes, a variety of frescoes. Next picture. And finally, coming out from the other side, I just point out one thing at the top. You'll see uh, just above the two doors, there are two uh, uh, statues, as it were. And neither have a head on. And it was quite common to see headless um, figures because they were beheaded during the wars of religion. And you'll see that everywhere that we went in uh, the Rome <laughs> Valley, you got to the different churches and there were these figures without heads. Next picture. Uh, on our walk, uh, we visited uh, the synagogue, which is quite modest compared to, of course, the uh, big palace of the Pope. And it's located right now in the place called Place Jerusalem Square. And this is where the Jews were uh, forced to live in a ghetto um, back in the uh, 13th century. But they were actually, it was a good place for them to, to live when they were put into the area because they were protected by the church. They actually protected the Jewish people in this area at the time. Next picture. Okay. So there were two optional excursions I think that we're going to talk about. Uh, one is Chateauneuf de Pap that I did, and the other one is Le Beau that Don and, Ma and Lorna did. Okay. So next picture. So we went to visit Chateau Neuf de Pape. I like to drink wine and I like wine from the Rhone Valley and Chateau Neuf de Pape. So I was interested in this. And this is the town of Chateau Neuf de Pape. And there's this uh, remnant of a castle up at the top. Next picture. I was shocked. This is what the soil looks like in Chateau Neuf de Pape. It's just these rocks. Everywhere, every all the vineyards look like this. Next picture. And here's another one. And the main grape that they grow is Grenache. But there, as you can see, the whole list of other grapes that they grow in the region, much less of less importance than the Grenache. The Mouvedre and Syrah, the two others that are most commonly grown. Next picture. So we went to visit this castle. The remnant of the castle, it really is just a shell with a, one's, only one wall basically intact and the half of another wall. So it looks better from the other side, from down lower. Next picture. <laughs> Next picture. And here is looking down on the town from where the ca castle is. Castle, of course, is always on a high point fortification viewpoint. You can see the river, the Rhone River in the distance. Next picture. And then we visited the town itself. Quaint little town. This is City Hall on the right hand side. Next picture. Interesting yep. streets. 
not too many people when we were there. And I will hand over now to Lorna and Don, who will carry on with the ball. <clears throat> Thanks, Paul. Uh, anyway, another, another option, as Paul pointed out, another optional excursion was to, to Le Beau. Uh, and the, on the, the first slide here on the top, you can see that there's a remnants of a, of a castle that's actually used part of the rock that it's built on to, for part of the fortification. It's in ruins now, but we'll take you up to a, have a closer look. Now, this was a real powerhouse in the 11th century. The, the Lords of Bull controlled about 80 towns in the area and were fighting, fought the, the Council of Barcelona for control of Provence, but, but they lost. And eventually became part of France, but uh, the uh, the Lords of Bow quarreled with the king who basically destroyed the, force and, the fortress in 1483. And the, the, the final straw was when the, uh, it became a center for Protestantism and Cardinal Richelieu, following the orders of the of the French king, ordered the destruction of the of the fortification, and apparently he built a town for the cost of the uh, destruction, which is kind of mean. Anyway, that's another shot of the 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 how the, the fortification used the rock as part of its defense uh, mechanism. They had a couple of, of siege machines there. There's a battering ram on the left and a and a catapult. On the right, and again, this is down inside the the fortification, which is part of it has been hewn out of the out of the stone. A magnificent view from the top of this, uh, as 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 Paul pointed out, they would always build the castles on the highest point available, and this was a very very high point in the area. A magnificent views. Now, this is probably one of the most unsafest places we ever visited on any trip. Because you can see how worn those steps are to get up to the top, but we were brave and fool about well, foolish anyway, uh, and the we're inching our way down in this particular case. But I go down backwards because it's safer. If you fall, you only fall on your face instead of down all the steps. And just as in the case of Chateau, uh, the Chateau at uh, Chateau Neuf de Pape or the Castle Parnay, there is a, a the, the town or village of, of Lebo below the fortress and it's a, a beautiful little village with uh, uh, stone buildings all kinds of stone walls some really good restaurants and and the there are no cars there's a parking lot outside the uh, just close to the top of the mountain there's a, a big uh, a largest parking parking lot but after that it's it's everybody you know just uh, w just walk but just a, a beautiful little town. Now our, our next trip after leave, our next stop, pardon me, after leaving Avignon was uh, was Vivier, and the the picture on the right is the the cathedral at, at Vivier, which is Saint Vincent's Cathedral. It was built in the well, he started in the 12th century, and uh, it's considered to be the the smallest cathedral in France. It's still an active, you know, it's a the home of a bishop, so it's still a, a real cathedral. And like other churches in the area, it suffered during the, the wars of religion between the Protestants and the Huguenots, uh, pardon me, the Protestants and Catholics. But it's been rebuilt to it's a pretty magnificent uh, state. So the Vivier was basically founded by the Bishop of Alba, who fled Alba in, three, in 300 AD, fleeing the barbarians, or at least the what were called about barbarians at the time, but anyway, uh, fled with the with the entire uh, village, I guess, uh, uh, to upriver or downriver. This case to uh, to Vivier, and and looked for a, a, a place to set up. And one of the most attractive places was that huge rock promontory there. And in in the the time that he that they they moved there, that rock would have been right at the level of, of the water, but the uh, silted, it's been silted up since then. One of the things that really attracted us was the, we, we docked right beside this avenue of plane trees and we started our walk by walking for what, equivalent to about, I guess, two, two, two city blocks in Canada down this magnificent arbor of, uh, of plane trees. And again, no cars, no cars allowed. Uh, the buildings are built on medieval foundations. So you'll notice that there's a brace between the building on the left and the building on the right. 
And the building on the right is leaning a little bit. It's not a, a fault of the camera. But they've actually built that archway in there to keep the two buildings from collapsing on each other. Another point, and this one, the, the lighting was poor. On the right-hand side, this actually is a, a an archway that joins two buildings. It's uh, it's two levels. There's, there's two sets of windows on it. And this was built, I guess, by some rich person who owned property on both uh, on, I guess the buildings on both sides and built this archway so they wouldn't have to walk across uh, between buildings at street level because back in the medieval times the streets were also sewers so uh, it wasn't a very auspicious wasn't a good place to walk if you could avoid it there's a uh, the one of the things we enjoyed was the decorations that people put on their on the on some of their walls and doors the one on the left is the trompe l'oeil effect with a with a cat sticking out i'll tell you more about a cat a little bit later on and one of the attractions in the place is a building called the house of knights which uh was a four-story townhouse and it was uh, uh nobody knows why it's called the house of knights because apparently it has nothing to do with knights but it's very richly decorated. It was decorated during the Renaissance by someone named Noel Albert, who was uh, a tax collector for the French king, who appa apparently made his fortune by skimming tax money uh, that he collected before he sent on the, the res res residue to the to the French king. Now, at one point, I guess he, he disappeared from town, and they came back with on the on the side of the Huguenots, on the side of the Protestants, in other words. To, to raid the town, but he was captured and, and beheaded. So it just didn't have a very good uh, outcome. One of the things that we really enjoyed was this cat on the right. Uh, and according to our guide, this cat basically appears for every time there's a walking group that goes through the town, the, the cat appears and walks beside them. And the one of the, and the, the cats are really quite prized in town because they keep down the rat population. And one of the people on our, our tour got a, a picture of the cat, this cat, disappearing into a hole in the in the foundation of one of the buildings, probably looking for lunch or something. And just another one of the, there's a Vivier fixer-upper, a beautiful, wonderful stone building that I, he, uh, presumably dating, at least parts of it would date from the, from the Middle Ages. And uh, just, uh, it looks so impressive to us where from a country where everything is so new. And then another street on the right. And what our guide told us, I, 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 I have no reason to disbelieve her, but one of the reasons that these streets are built with the, a smooth pathway in the middle and rougher on the sides is that the, although this would be good for drainage as well, is that the streets are built for, for donkey carts. So the donkey would have a better chance of, of walking on the center and then, of course, the, the cartwheels would be on the on the edges. Oh. Now, after living leaving Vivier, uh, I guess overnight it, we overnighted in Vivier, and then the next morning, took a uh, the boat took us to a place called Tournon, where there's a an, uh, a narrow gauge railway that uh, goes along the river Du. Now, this particular bridge we're crossing here, and we've. Uh, most of them were a couple of closed cars. We, we were in one of the open cars. It was a beautiful day, so we didn't mind going in the car, in the car at all. Each car had its own guide. I think there were several different tour groups who, who joined the trip. I'm not sure often it runs. Now, the trip we took was only about an hour return, so we didn't do the whole the whole route. But the, the bridge that we're going across now was built in 1438. And one at the time it was built, it was the, the longest bridge in France. So they, they did a pretty good job of building this thing because now they can run a train over it. Any of the, <clears throat> the train, the, the tra train is, the, the route, pardon me, is about 33 kilometers long and was opened in, in 1891. And the, the big blue arrow here points to the, the line leading down to Colombier le, le Vieux, which was the, the farthest point that we went to. Where we could train, where they could turn the, the train around or turn the engine around. Now this is one of the views along the uh, along the, the gorge, uh, along the river valley. Uh, just a, a gorgeous spot. And this, when I said they turned the train around, I meant they turned the engine around. 
And however well designed this particular roundabout is, it's basically operated by this one man. There's no there's no machine involved. So he turns the, the, the train around, so it chugs down to the other end of the train so it can take us back uh, to where we where we started. On the parallel in the 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 river on the other side is an, an aqueduct. You can see the archway on the, the slide on the left, and then perhaps the something of the the aqueduct here on the right hand side of the of the leftmost slide. Now this was built by German prisoners of war during World War I as a, a way to bring water down to a powerhouse that was built here on the, you'll see that on the right hand side. So the water was channeled to the penstocks on the on the right. Um, at one point, this this uh, powerhouse was inhabited by by a family because they had to operate the gates to let the the water come down. But now it's, it's actually still in use as a as a source of power, but everything's automated, so it's run from some remote location. And here I managed to get a picture of the the railway tunnel on the left, uh, and the and the powerhouse on the right. After the uh, after the the um, the trip on the train, the ship took us to a, the town of, of Vienne, where we're going to spend another night. And we had an actually a late afternoon tour in this in this case. And Vienne again is is known for some magnificent Roman Roman ruins. Mm -hmm. This one is the called the, the Temple of Augustus in Livia. And one of the reasons it survived the uh, I guess the urban quarrying that befell most of the other, many of the other Roman ruins. So that very early on, it became a, 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 a Roman Catholic church. So the spaces between the columns was filled in to create a, an enclosed building. And they've only, I'm not sure when they started, but they basically removed the, that, that part of the history of the thing to reveal the magnificent uh, temple to Augustus and his wife, uh, Livia. The, uh, excuse me, another feature of the uh, town is the uh, St. Uh, Maurice Cathedral. Um, it was begun in, in 1130, finished much, much later. Sometimes these, as many of you know, I'm sure you, most of you know, these cathedrals took hundreds of years to build. Magnificent uh, in, inside stained glass windows and wonderful decoration. Now, this is something that we didn't get to, but uh, so I had to rip this from the internet. The It's a, a Roman theater, and this is one of, I guess, the highlights of, uh, of Vienne. I mentioned before that the walking groups were organized by, by level of ability. The youngest and fittest basically took the trip up the mountain to the Roman theater, which curiously was remained uh, undiscovered from the fourth century until it was until 1922 when it was... Uh, uh, rediscovered and then uh, uh, kind of cleared up. So it's 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 a uh, you know no, no, it's used for all kinds of occasions now. Now we're on our way to Lyon, and this is an area on the on the Rhone where you can see the hundreds of one of the uh, many many wineries or, or vineyards, pardon me, that appears along along the river, uh, mostly on the north side. I guess because at the, the uh, sorry, mostly on the um, west side. And there's one of the, the I mentioned, I think there was 18 locks between Arla and, uh, and Lyon. This is this is one of them, again, with the vineyard in the background. Uh, the locks are used for power power generation as well as irrigation and, uh, of course, uh, aid, to, aid to navigation. There's uh, uh, somebody, some, a group practicing their rowing along the Rhone. Houses coming right down to the to the river itself, and I guess they because of the lock system they can exercise some kind of flood control. But some of those houses look pretty vulnerable if there was a lot of water in that river. Uh, and a, a power plant beside the beside the river, and now we're we're in Lyon, which is our our last stop. That's the third largest city in France, and uh, again as features as. Uh, uh, as a, a long history of uh, dating back to Roman times. Well, there's not much, at least we didn't see anything in, left in Lyon that really said much about the, there's a, a, a bit of an amphitheater we didn't visit, didn't visit, but 
was the capital of Roman Gaul. It was a st strategic location. Uh, there's a the Fourvier Hill overlooks the entire area. It was the center of the silk industry from the 15th through the 18th centuries. Now it's mostly industrial and, and I guess educational. It's, uh, the University of Lyon is, uh, is world famous. And uh, what's infamous, I guess, about Lyon was the headquarters for the Gestapo, the notorious Klaus Barbie, the butcher of Lyon during World War II. Now the, on the uh, so this is a picture taken we're going to show you the, the church in, in a, uh, a moment, but taken at the, at the top of Fourier Hill, overlooking the city. And this is the River Sion on the, the left-hand side the, in, the, in, the, in the foreground. The next row of trees is the Rhone, so you can see how, how close the two rivers are. Uh, the building on the left is, is nicknamed the Pencil by local uh, residents. It's unusual to see these tall buildings. And the, and the other one is next to it, close to it, is, nicknamed the eraser. And uh, then a, a, a closer look at the bridge over the Seon at the on the right hand side. Uh, now this is the, the I took the pictures from the from the the plaza outside this particular basilica. Uh, it's nicknamed the elephant basilica because some people see an elephant lying on its back with four feet in the air. And it was built between 1872 and 1884, as I indicate here, to to thank for thanks to Mary for sparing the city from inv invasion during the Franco-Prussian War. Magnificent sculptures uh, uh, all over the, and it remained undamaged because it was didn't put, wasn't started till the 19th century, so it didn't suffer from the Re French Revolution or the or the religious wars. Uh, incredibly richly decorated inside. A couple of shots of the the nave and the, and the ceiling, uh, some of the sculptures on the side walls. Uh, these are uh, uh, parts of the tiles on the floor, which are just a magnificent uh, mosaics. And outside, there was a local entertainment. Uh, Lorna, tell me about the accordion. Is. <clears throat> well, I played the accordion when I was a kid. And so I was watching this guy, and I, I said to him, mon grand-père, my grandfather, and I pointed to his button accordion, buttons for the right-hand side, as well as the left. And then I, and I pointed to myself, and I said, moi. And then I did like the fingering on a piano on the keyboard. And he had this gorgeous smile. He, he understood my pigeon French. And and the action that was going on, so. And then he spoke to you in English. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and it was it was a, a beautiful day. These the next pictures are taken down at the at the level of the old town, and they asked this couple of the, the kids and, and they seem to be having a joy a great time with their kids. I asked their permission before taking the picture, and for some reason there were a lot of school children around. So I don't know if it was uh, the the day for field trips or whatever. Uh, the only difficulty he had with was uh, was finding a public washroom that got there ahead of the kids because <laughs> it took him a long time. The, 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 yeah, a whole classroom of kids hit the washroom just before we did, and we had to. We finally decided it was worth a cup of coffee to go into a cafe. <laughs> now the the uh, another interesting thing about uh, well, fascinating historical thing about. Uh, Lyon. about Lyon is the the Traboul. Now these are passages between buildings. Just to what happens is that in the Middle Ages, there were the the main streets uh, in the in the old town were very very long with no intersections. So if you were carrying, if you were in, in the silk business or something, you had to carry some material from one street to another. It became kind of a drag to have to walk. To, uh, what the equivalent of several blocks before you could cross over to the to the next street. So they built there are hundreds of them, and and I guess there are about forty or fifty of them now that's, that are still in operation. Patches ways within buildings that take you from one street to the next. And the, uh, it was too dark in all these tribals for me to take pictures of them. So I, these are from the from the internet. They're all different styles, different shapes because of the you go through different buildings. In some cases, I guess we were admonished by our guide to be quiet as we went through, because in some cases, there are apartments right above where you're 
where you're walking through and the residents aren't that happy with them. They're making a lot, making a lot of noise. So they became really central to the resistance during World War II because the, the local residents really knew these places like the inside uh, back of their hand and would use them for smuggling messages, uh, uh, harassing the Germans and then disappearing quite uh, quite rapidly uh, throughout the uh, through these troubles. And, and that's uh, I think one of the most important features of them. The, the cathedral in, in uh, Lyon is named after St. John the Baptist began in 1180 and competed in 1476. Again, a magnificent looking building. And you can see, as Paul pointed out, the beheaded religious figures on a lot of these, uh, a lot of these places. And uh, so, some of the uh, uh, Roman ruins in Lyon. Now our side trip was to the Beaujolais wine country. Paul went to the Chateau Neuf de Pop. We were in, in Beaujolais. Uh, close to Beaujolais, so we took the bus trip there. It was a, a great day for going to the visit the Chateau de Ravatis, and who were known for their Brie wine, called the Brie. The in this case, the uh, Viking had split the group up into I think seven different groups, and they went to seven different wineries. We happened to go to this one, which was beautiful, beautifully uh, located, uh, nice wine. And they feature organic wine. There's the chateau that the winery is named after. And this is something I guess Paul didn't point it out. I think he had the same feature in his vineyards there. These the wine vines there are very low, and that they call it goblet pruning. And in order to have the appellation for this particular Beaujolais, it has to you have to be grow your grapes on uh, on vines that are like this. Can you imagine picking harvesting grapes from something that be like on your hands and knees? Apparently, there's a movement by the local wine growers to try to get approval for growing grapes on, on wires like they do in other parts of the world and other parts of France. But right now, that's you, you're stuck with that way of, of pruning. And there's just an example of the wines we're going to taste and the uh, young woman who is handing them out. And this uh, is the, the Beaujolais wine is named after the village of Beaujeu. And this is a lovely uh, 12th century church, St. Nicholas Church features in Beaujeu. Again, beautifully, beautifully uh, preserved. And that's it. We're back on our boat and we're getting ready to have our final supper. Pack up our bags, have them picked up at about, I think it was six o'clock in the morning so we can catch the train to, to, uh, to Paris for our Paris excursion. So thank you for your patience. Thanks very much, Don. If you could, uh, you have stopped sharing perfectly. I will look at gallery view here. Are there any um, comments or questions from anyone in the audience? And you can unmute yourselves and if you want to ask a question or say something. Oh. Sarah, I see your hand up in the air. <clears throat> Unmute, please. Thank you. Hi, Don. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Lorna. Um, Hi, Sarah. You may or may not remember me as Sarah Reader. I do. I see um, your dad on the same screen at the same that's time. That's right. <laughs> so thanks, Dad, for letting me know about this. Um, and uh, just for other people, I was a graduate student. Um, uh, political science when Don was the department head and he was one of the readers on my thesis as well so um, lots of good memories there and interesting uh, confluence of events as well because um, I had a couple well one coincidental um, reason why this has been an interest in that I'm reading right now um, Mrs. Van Gogh which is a uh, fabulous novel. I don't know if anyone's read it. It's a New York Times bestseller that came out, I believe, last year that takes mm -hmm. place in Paris in um, 1888. So right around the time um, that you were describing. And so a lot of the backstory, it's a, it's a reimagined um, memoir um, about um, Theo Van Gogh, which is his younger brother's um, wife from her perspective. 
So very interesting companion piece for anyone who enjoyed this presentation <laughs> um, to read about, uh, you know, the other things that were happening around Arles and, uh, and Paris at that time. Um, super interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but secondly, also, um, my husband and I were invited, he's a UBC alumni as well. And he we were in uh, when we met there, actually, which is which is interesting, but um, we were invited by Worldwide Quest, which is the company that organizes the alumni um, travel excursions for, for UBC alumni to host a trip in France, a river cruise um, with Viking um, next June. So um, I guess my question is, our trip will be wine focused because um, one iteration of what my husband and I do, I'm, I'm a journalist and he's a chef, but we also have a vineyard in the Okanagan and we have a, a small wine brand. So we will be hosting um, lectures on board every evening, or actually not every evening, every second evening. And it's about this, it's a similar time frame. We start in Paris we we do um, an excursion at one of the chateaus, um, and then we start on our cruise. And we're going through Burgundy, but through the River Yon area of it. So northern Burgundy, more like um, Chablis area, would be the most famous appellation. Um, but my question is a little bit more pedestrian. It's more about the the logistics of the of the boat and um, our boat will be much smaller it's 19 cabins so very much smaller um and it's called uh le fleur and uh it does have a chef it's owned by a chef apparently but how were the meals how was the wi-fi <laughs> i mean uh, it's, it's more logistical uh inquiries that i have how was the, the experience um on board was there, were there, did you, was there any animation on board once you were there? Would, did they have presentations in the evenings or were you on your own? How did that all work? I guess they had a, a presentation, but typically every late afternoon before dinner. And, and sometimes they would have events following dinner, like, you know, dances or singers or entertainment of, of that sort. But they always had someone, someone giving historical information about the particular area. We thought the food services are really quite e really quite efficient because uh, there's only one sitting. So and there were what ninety passengers or, or I mean hundred and whatever I said passenger two hundred uh, hundred ninety two passengers, and they managed to they had a lot of wait staff there who were and the it seems that everybody would chip in even like the head people would be kind of there helping out uh, clearing tables or or taking orders and 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 this sort of thing. So the 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 ratio of of crew to to, uh, uh, to passengers was was pretty uh, pretty impressive. impressive. Well, sir, are you sure that the ship you are going on is Viking? Because yes. really, because I I'm not I wasn't aware that Viking had such small boats, and you say it's owned by a chef, because all all, all the Viking ships are owned by the Viking company, as far as I knew that. Uh, with quite a large company. Oh, I realized that. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but that's the information that I have. And okay. I do know that obviously river cruising has become so incredibly popular that they've actually had to, you know, regulate the season and that kind of thing, because there's just so many boats out there. So my guess is that they've opened it up to some of the smaller boats. Um, and so there's maybe an opportunity for for um, smaller boats. I'm not sure exactly, but yeah. But right. it is overseen by Viking. So I'm guessing the brand standards will be the same. Because I think the type of ship that both uh, Dawn and I went on are much larger than what you're talking about. And the experience that you're likely to have on such a small ship might be more akin to a barge experience than one of these long ship experiences. Right. Um, you said only about 20 people on the... Uh, yeah. uh, well, for, it will be 40, so they're double people, yeah. yeah. So quite a lot smaller than these. Absolutely. Ships. I think, Helen, you were going to ask something. Yes, Paul. My question was for you. Did you see any of the wild horses at the Camargue? Yes, we did. 
I was not impressed with uh, them. Uh, they were white horses. They're, that's the other thing that the Camargue region is famous for. From the photography point of view, I didn't take any photographs of the horses. I, I did photograph the bulls, but not the horses. But we did see them on the same trip. Okay. And they were pointed out to us. <clears throat> and you know, I, you, um, I didn't go to their boat this time. I'm going to get to you, Lorna and Don, right now. But Don and Lorna, we went to Les Beaux 20 years ago. Remember walking up the same little pathways, the little narrow streets. And I actually bought a painting, a small painting that still sits in my house from an artist on one of those streets. So I mm. have fond memories of that particular location. That's great. <clears throat> Go ahead. I was going to add something to uh, your comment about the rocky soil of the, uh, of the vineyards. We were told that they bring the rocks in and lay it on the top of the soil so that they can absorb the heat of the sun through the day and keep the vineyard nice and toasty warm through the night. So, so underneath all those rocks, there is actually normal soil. Agree. And but they had that in Chateau Neuf de Pape, but we went to Beaujol, so uh, to a different winery than you did, and they don't have the rocks there. No, no. no that's right. They were quite uh, particular to Chateau Neuf de Pape region of the Rhone Valley. Steve, Stephen Savitt. Yeah. Well, did you choose Viking for uh, strong reasons or just because it's so well known? Are there, you said there are lots of competitive lines that do these tours i guess that we, we went this is only the second time we've done this with uh, second river cruise and both with viking i guess we just uh we liked it just picked out a thin air i think maybe mm -hmm. perhaps the advertising was more prominent uh we did a tour on the danube so we decided if we want to do this again we'll we'll stick with viking no mm -hmm. no didn't really do serious research but the prices seem to be pretty comparable and when i looked at, at and preparing for this talk, most of the itineraries seem to be about the same. So you wound up seeing the, the same boats at the same places. Well, Stephen, I, I've been on about six Viking River cruises now. Um, <clears throat> generally, I've been very pleased with them. They, they provide a very good mix of um, education and food quality. So I appreciate that. And as far as on board, we always have had uh, somebody coming and talking to us about history uh, or one trip talked about uh, about art and some entertainment. They're not like the large ship's entertainment. It was like a, a singer uh, singing like Edith Piaf type songs and stuff like that. Uh, uh, very uh, small because it's only 190 people, some of the ships are 150 people, so they don't have these extravaganzas that you'll have on ocean, big ocean liners. Yeah. But we've been quite pleased with them generally. Thanks. Any other comments, questions? Anyhow, well, again, I uh, thank everyone for joining us today. And I want to thank Don for uh, putting this presentation together and allowing me to participate with him in uh, a slightly different uh, type of presentation. And just to uh, let you know that uh, next month um, on uh, April, no, next month is March. So what do I have in March? Oh, Peter Dodek is going to be talking to us on March the 7th about trip to Turkey and to Rhodes. I think you've had Peter talk to us once before with a wonderful video type of presentation with music and him uh, narrating throughout. So it should be quite exciting. Remember, it's a little bit early. We usually meet a little bit later in the month, but I'm going to be away um, on a different trip the following week. And my backup person who normally is here, Nancy Langton, she's going to be away on another trip. <laughs> so uh, since Peter was uh, agreeable to talk earlier, we decided to put it uh, on a date when one of us could be here to moderate the session. 
Uh, when we get back to April, we'll be back up to the 18th, and then we'll have a talk by Joel Auger on his experiences traveling in Syria just before the Civil War broke up. So that should be quite interesting and different for us to listen to.